Welcome to BizTax, Asia's hottest startup show. Our guest for today is Mingjie Chua. He's the CEO of Avid Technology. Avid Technology is a healthcare AI and big data company with a mission to transform healthcare using data intelligence. Now tell us to more, uh, Mingjie, and welcome to the show. Thank you, Brian. Thank you so much for having me. For a start, tell us about the genesis of Avid and its relationship with you do tech. Great, yeah. So, um, every technology is a health technology company, uh, and uh, you know we were set up with the aim to leverage data intelligence to drive better healthcare outcomes. Uh, every tech was set up about two years plus ago. Uh, that was in the midst of the first wave of the COVID nineteen pandemic, uh, and just a bit of you know that background of myself. So, I, I did not come from a healthcare. Uh, background. I started my career in a sovereign wealth fund uh, doing public markets investment. Uh, and that was where I got exposed to the healthcare sector through the lens of the investor. Uh, and that's also where I observed the problems faced by uh, healthcare systems globally. This includes the unsustainable increase in healthcare costs uh, exacerbated by the large amount of waste that continues to be generated along the supply chain, whether unintended or deliberate. Um, and I also learned about the misalignment of interest that's inherent in the fee for in, a, in the traditional fee for service model. So I saw the potential to leverage technology to connect healthcare stakeholders to improve decision making, to add objectivity and transform care delivery. Right? So that's really that motivation of you know that that value that I would like to bring to market. And that motivation started when I was still in that position of an investor. So I started looking at companies which, you know, play into that space. Okay. Uh, and two years plus ago, when I was given the opportunity uh, to set up every technology with the support of e 2 uh, and Brunei Investment Agency, I jumped on that opportunity. Okay, so, and that's a quick, that's a quick uh, go to market strategy. Yes, uh, and it was very, it was opportunistic at point in time because actually, uh, you know, BIA is also an investor of E2Tech. So when the COVID-19 pandemic hit, uh, within that first week, Brunei was looking for a solution that could help them address, uh, you know, the problems that they're facing. And a lot is actually related to resource constraint and having a timely and accurate view of what's going on, uh, you know, in the community. Um, so there we had the opportunity to leverage, uh, you know, the technology accumulation that e 2 Tech has uh, and with funding from EIA, you know, um, set up a company and start developing solutions uh, that then uh, can be implemented immediately to support the Brunei government. Okay, and, and it's interesting, I want to dive a little bit deeper about this because Essentially, collaboration is very important in terms of driving sustainable and impactful change. Healthcare is a business that, or an industry that perhaps is a laggard compared to banking in terms of technology adoption. Yes. So could you, and, and that's where you saw it probably through your investor lens. Yeah. So could you kind of uh, give us a deep dive into some of the collaboration that you've done with, with the folks at the Ministry of Health in Singapore, for example, you've just touched on the Brunei government, yes. and then walk us through some of, of the collaboration that you, you're doing in other areas as well. Sure. Yeah, I think um, you know, two, two things that I want to uh, point out. One is, um, you know, the areas that we focus on is outcome-based, right? So um, when it comes to outcome-based, then the relationship with the client is very important. So that involves, um, you know, that transformation of that relationship from more traditional client vendors of relationship to one that's more collaborative and iterative. Um, and the other, uh, as you rightly mentioned, uh, healthcare is a very complex industry and really to, to um, you know, to sort of initiate that change uh, and to have that change happen required close collaboration, public-private, as well as a broader ecosystem. Uh, and for what we do, research is very key. So research community is a very core component of that uh, ecosystem. And so, um, you know, for Singapore, for instance, our project with the 
uh, Ministry of Health Singapore, we actually also work with experts from the NUS or School of Public Health to co-develop and productionize statistical risk models um, for, for COVID-19. Okay. Um, and uh, ongoing, we also have you know, other initiatives um, um, you know, going on as well. And it involves the policymakers, it involves uh, the research uh, side of things as well. Um, could you share with us some of, uh, uh, so that our audience could can get their heads around this because it seems all very vague, could yeah. you give us some specific examples uh, mm. that will help us understand better? Sure. So, um, you know, when it comes to, for, for instance, the earlier example that I mentioned, so we, we developed a, a platform uh, that analyzes the COVID-19 risk of countries globally. So we extract data that is part publicly actually available uh, of these countries. And from this information, we actually make a prediction of the uh, you know, transmission progression of in each countries. So that helps uh, the ministry uh, in their you know, policy measures in terms of border control, et cetera. Okay. Um, and uh, the other platform that we had is a community risk exposure model. Uh, and that model was actually first developed by experts from NUS Hospital Health School of Public Health. Um, and we work with them uh, with our technology capability to productionize those models. Right? So previously, those models, if you run it on platform, it cost hours to do. So it's not very easy to iterate. And when you really want to use it to make decisions, um, you know, for the amount of runtime, it's not very practical. So once we actually productionize, uh, actually it takes just minutes to run those models so that we can iterate faster. And then from there, uh, we also then bring our expertise and experience uh, of running similar models in other countries uh, to enhance that model. So that is an example that was specific to COVID-19. Another example that I want to raise, so that's actually cross border. Uh, so, you know, of our work uh, in Brunei, um, uh, we built the uh, big data platform there. So that aggregates data from their uh, public hospital system, private healthcare system, uh, population database, right? So with that wealth of data, there's actually a lot of research um, that you can do. Uh, rather, you know, initially might be more COVID uh, pandemic related, but now we are looking at, you know, more sort of NCD population health. So that, um, <clears throat> so for the pandemic research, that actually involves the Brunei Ministry of Health, mm -hmm. NUS, as well as a local university, uh, uh, UPD in Brunei, where it's actually a joint collaboration. Okay. Uh, so, and that, that research is still ongoing. And right now we are also looking at a population-based research. Uh, and again, that is in Brunei, it involves the Brunei uh, Ministry of Health and also another uh, you know, research institution in Singapore. Uh, that will be announced very soon. So um, I probably will wait till you know, we make that public announcement to sort of like disclose the institution as well as the content of that collaboration. Now, MJ, one of the key things with healthcare, uh, especially when it concerns public health and aggregated data of public and uh, private uh, uh, institutions is the fact that Electronic medical records or EMR is not shared in a lot of countries. Now, your two examples of Brunei and Singapore are small populations. So aggregation is easy because basically, especially in a Singapore context, the EMR is shared. Yeah. How do you see this collaboration then expanding, especially then because you have better data sets uh, if you are able to actually extract the data out in different markets? Yeah, so I think for us, it's also that recognizing that the you know, data sovereignty issue uh, and data ownership issue. So we place a lot of uh, you know, emphasis on data governance. Um, and, um, and so for, for the solutions um, that we deploy uh, in the different sites with different clients, that's something that we... Um, you know, we, we, we were uh, sort of ensure. Um, and so, uh, you know, in Brunei, the data is actually, uh, we reset it in Brunei. Uh, for Singapore, it's the same, it would be in Singapore. But I think there's a lot of 
benefit now in terms of knowledge sharing and expertise sharing. So a lot of this research collaboration that I speak about is actually that, right? So, uh, you know, the Brunei side, they have the data, right? But they may not have all the expertise to analyze that data. Uh, that is where expertise in Singapore, uh, you know, can sort of add value when we work together. Uh, and for this researcher, some of these researchers uh, in Singapore, you know, they may not be able to gain access to some of those data that Brunei have, right? So once we brought that uh, platform, we allow for these experts to collaborate in a secure way. Um, and um, then there's the part of, okay, how do I, for the same use cases, uh, let my algorithm actually learn from a broader set of data? Okay. Um, and right now we are also, uh, you know, making investments in technology like federated learning, distributed computing, uh, that potentially can allow us to be more effective at doing that. Um, I would say that, um, you know, right now it's still quite early on, right? So from the infrastructure perspective, we are able to do that, right? But the issue is actually ensuring the integrity of the model because there are things like data bias, etc that we have to think about. So that is something that we are also doing co-development um, with a research institution in Singapore, right, to perfect uh, that technology. So I, I would say that, um, you know, collaboration comes in many, uh, comes at many levels. Uh, right now, a lot of what we are doing is really at that expertise and experience sharing, right? So that when we have access to data, how do we leverage the resources that we have, the expertise, not only from just that country, right, but region or global, to extract that insight, such that the insight can then be shared. And separately, you know, when we are talking about leveraging across larger uh, data sets, um, it's something that we are looking at as well. But we say that um, you know, it's, it's still quite early for that. Um, and there's still a lot of value that can be extracted you know, just by collaborating uh, and sharing the expertise. So you basically have three main product suites of uh, solutions. You, you've got something called Avid Evidence and Avid Surveillance and Avid Health. Tell us how this then helps countries and public health systems basically um, mm. execute what you've just painted. Sure. So um, I'll start with Evidence. So that's our flagship data operating platform. Uh, so that supports, um, you know, a variety of uh, stakeholders. They can be policymakers, health authorities, um, healthcare providers, payers, and researchers to enhance the uh, governance and usability of their data uh, by converting uh, their data to computable, structured, and standardized data with speed and accuracy, uh, and also en en enabling real-time data monitoring and traceability. Uh, so that's very important you know, for the governance aspect of things, uh, for um, precise structured search, uh, flexible access configuration. So that supports multiple users on that same platform where different users, you can set the access rights. Um, uh, secure sandbox operations. Uh, so the data then can be used to uh, import into sandbox with permission and to run different, um, you know, uh, to run different applications and use cases, or to power, you know, third-party solutions uh, and third-party connectivity. So a lot of, um, you know, what I describe when it comes to collaboration um, is supported and enabled by this foundational platform. Okay. And avid surveillance uh, and every health. So those are the, uh, what we call the use case applications, right? So okay. it drives specific outcomes in different use cases. So every surveillance um, um, serves the public health surveillance uh, sort of aspect of the healthcare. Um, and it aggregates data from a variety of sources. And, uh, this, uh, and this can include um, medical record, uh, case reports, users, uh, user questionnaires, and even digital media to help public health officials to track, monitor, and analyze the incidence of influenza-like illnesses and 30 over infectious diseases in real time. 
so that potential emergencies can be more timely detected and prevented. And every health, so that's our population health solution. It analyzes data to enable the early detection of individuals at risk of chronic and critical illnesses so that they can be directed to the relevant screening and be given the appropriate advice. We also analyze behavioral data uh, that's gathered from users' interaction with our services so that we can optimize nudges to improve adherence to tailored health plans that we also partner with our clients to design. And that is a very important thing because a lot of times, you know, all this works in theory, but if you don't have, as you said, little nudges to the individual patients, they're not going to stick to their plans. That's right. That's right. We see that actually as a very big sort of, you know, that, that problem that we have to address, right? Because very often we do at intervention, we can design the most perfect plans, but if nobody is going to follow <laughs> it, exactly. To it, yes, that's right. Now, I want to zoom in now on Avid, the company. You're only two years old. You've scaled very quickly. You went from a five-person company to, you've got 200 people now across Singapore, Brunei, Beijing, and Shanghai. Tell us about this journey and how you scaled so quickly. What's been the catalyst for growth? Yeah, I think for, for us, is, um, it's identifying the, the real demand uh, and being able to you know, deliver that value to meet that demand. Uh, and, and one thing that I would also like to share is, you know, for a two-year company, we are actually cash flow positive. Um, and okay, that, and tell us about, as, before you drill down, and that's an interesting thing, how have you become cash flow positive with 200 employees? What's your business model like? Yeah, so I think that goes back to, to you know, the earlier introduction of, you know, starting from a finance background, et cetera, right? and, uh, you know, from the lens of an investor. So I mentioned at that point, you know, I will be looking at companies that I can invest in that deliver value that I think is required in the healthcare sector. But the issue is very often, and I, I, I was actually a tech investor, and the issue is we always are over-optimistic. And we think that things can happen a lot faster, right? And yes. in reality, that doesn't. So then when it comes to them running the business itself, I think fundamentally, you know, I've, I've of that view that adopted, adoption in healthcare takes time. And the problem that we are trying to address in healthcare is a waste issue. It's actually also a financing issue, right? So our eye is very important. So that's something that I focus on uh, when we make decisions, where to invest in, where to scale. Uh, we've been very fortunate uh, in the sense that um, you know, we have very close relationships, uh, close relationship with the customers that we work with. So for the customers that we serve, we actually manage to grow uh, our relationship with them. And quite um, you know, a fair bit of what we do are actually recurring in nature. Right? There are certain components that may be a bit more one-off because we need to deploy the systems. Right, but that service of data processing, intelligent driving outcomes, so that's actually quite recurring in Asia. So that allowed us to really plan our trajectory uh, in ahead of time with that visibility of the revenue. So the headcount actually really grow um, um, in line with how we are scaling uh, you know, that uh, engagement relationship with our existing customers. And that's interesting because a lot of startups, obviously, this is the big challenge, especially right now with the funding winter. It's all about um, getting to cash flow positive. But what are your plans for the next 12 months, uh, particularly uh, with regard to expansion geographically? Great. Yeah. So I think for us, we will be looking to continue to scale our talent pool uh, in two areas. So one is in the area of r and um, and uh, we believe that we do have that uh, you know, core competitive advantage that when we do our R&D, we can quickly validate it in the markets that we are already operate in uh, with our existing clients. Separately, uh, in terms of market expansion, um, so Southeast Asia, so that's our home ground. So we'll continue to um, you know, expand and grow and further penetrate in the region. Um, we expanded to US last year. We have a project that is that's scaling very nicely. 
Uh, we are in the process. And that's a big healthcare market with big dollars. It is. <laughs> it is. Uh, and that's it's one where there's also a lot of you know, legacy structural issues to address, right? So it's interesting for us. Um, and it's, um, um, and so we are in the process of setting up an office in the US. Um, and Middle East is also, um, you know, a market that we are interested in uh, because, uh, you know, Middle East, um, you know, the way that they are looking to transform their healthcare is very aligned to what we are seeing in you know, Brunei uh, in Singapore. Uh, one that's more value-based, uh, you know, concept of population health. And we believe that we have the expertise uh, to work closely with the health systems there, with the research ecosystem there. So that is an area that, you know, uh, in recent uh, recent months, we're starting to sort of take a closer look at. And very likely, we also set up operations there. So MJ, I want to zoom in on you right now. Now, you were basically an investor. You worked for Ant Financials before. You also worked uh, prior to this at GIC Singapore, the Sovereign Wealth Fund. Tell us about how you transitioned out of that multinational type, large corporation environment into the startup environment. And what were the key lessons that you've learned in the last two years? Okay, yeah. So I think when um, in you know, starting with GIC, right? So uh, there's very specific investment, public markets, specific sectors. But so you are actually then applying that skill set and experience uh, to look at different uh, investment to invest in. Uh, in and financial, I was also in sort of a finance capacity in their capital markets, corporate finance. So coming into uh, then transitioning into this role, um, it's, it's, it's a lot of learning uh, because I have to do a lot of things um, that, I've not, that I've not done before. And, um, and as you know, in you know, professional firm, generally you don't manage large teams. So people management is actually a huge, you know, huge challenge as well. Uh, and especially when it comes to things that you've not done before, even identifying the right talent for the right job, you know, that was a challenge. So I think uh, really is the ability to learn very quickly, to iterate, right? Okay to make mistakes, but then limit that scope of that mistake. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that's really key. And also, uh, you know, honestly speaking, because I didn't come from a healthcare background, right? So sometimes, you know, you, you may also question yourself, what, what's the edge that you really bring to the industry, uh, to the company, right? Because I'm not a uh, sort of a inventor uh, driven startup, right? Where they have that technical technique. So being able to, you know, identify the right talents, that's very important. Uh, but importantly is how do you really play to your strength? Uh, and for me, you know, it's really capital allocation making the right decisions where to focus on uh, and to make sure that, you know, we have that sustainability and that longevity and we can scale. So I think that's something that um, I, I focus on. Uh, and again, I think that's that awareness of, uh, you know, one strength that we need so, so that, you know, learning to amplify that strength and then finding ways to overcome, uh, you know, the weaknesses. MJ, it's been a fascinating conversation. I've really learned a lot and um, I'm excited, I think, for your future because obviously you're on a very fast growth trajectory. But before we leave, any final thoughts you'd like to leave us with? Thank you. Yeah, so I think, um, you know, I, I, I had to share that, um, you know, for healthcare, it's actually, you know, a, a difficult, complex sector, right? But I think that's really... Um, you know, a lot um, to be done um, and there's value that we can create, right? So then for us, it's really being patient, uh, make sure that we build that resilience, uh, that sustainability in our business model uh, and work closely with our partners and stakeholders to really develop and iterate uh, solutions that can deliver that value. Um, so I think that that's um, you know that's really our DNA, 
uh, and it's something that you know we keep in mind and focus on. I'm Brian Fernandez, and we've been speaking to Mingjie Chua. He's the CEO of Avid Technology on BizTech Asia's hottest startup show. This video and podcast will be on our various platforms as well as our website, www.biztech.asia. Please like and subscribe to our various platforms. Thanks again for tuning in.